is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering One Piece, season three ish, episodes 80, 81, and 82. In these episodes, we are on a wintry paradise island, a place full of skiing and hot chocolate and probably all kinds of fun traditions, except there are no doctors and there's a witch and the king is the monster who ate everything. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Bernadette for commissioning this episode. Bernadette is here in the chat and has had a headache the whole fucking day, so she's going to get a drink. I'm sorry about your headache, Bernadette. Headaches are the worst. Um, So these episodes, like, you know, guys, I think we all know that whenever Luffy deals with a bad guy and that guy just goes sailing off into the sunset, and by sailing, I mean, like, through the air, I just realized that it could sound like I'm talking about on a ship. I mean, when Luffy chucks somebody, which is frequently how he decides to deal with people, we have not seen the last of that person. However, there's usually more of a gap. And I was really surprised that we wind up seeing him again so soon. And I honestly kind of like it. You know, I think that it it worked to have there be a pause before because we didn't already know the score. We could guess that we would see them again, but it hadn't happened several times already. And so now that we have like all begun to catch on to that's how it's going to work, not having us like wait and delay that too much, that just seems smart to me. Um, this is also, it boils down to... A rich, powerful man denying health care to the poor just because he doesn't give a fuck. And I just can't help but take that very personally as an American. It is just so our whole situation that it's very difficult for me to not want to go on a fucking rant for 20 minutes about the 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 broken medical system and using health insurance as a hostage to keep people in bad abusive work situations not to mention abusive home situations and i had a friend who she stayed with an abusive spouse because she had uterine cancer and she needed the coverage and then she left him and then she got it back again. It came back and had to go back for, because otherwise she was going to wind up like hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. So I just personally have very strong feelings about the way our country's garbage, absolute horseshit system is set up. And it's so frustrating y'all because the whole message about how convoluted healthcare is in socialist countries is really like pervasive amongst people who haven't done their own research and there is a like i i cannot get over how people can talk about oh well you have to wait a long time to be seen by a doctor in Canada and meanwhile Owen has been waiting almost two full months for a fucking CPAP machine what why are we acting like that's not already how it is here you need a referral to see a specialist and you need to wait a month to see the doctor to get the referral once you get the referral it's another month to see this we also have to wait why do we act like that's not a thing I'm just so, I'm so mad, you guys. I am getting married 
in like three weeks and Monday I am going to go and get a almost $3,000 root canal because I don't have dental care. So I put off going to the dentist like most Americans who don't have dental care. And thus I wind up having to pay so much money right before a major event that already costs a ton of money. And I, this is just how I have to live. You know, I can't even like panic. I can't even freak out about it really because I know this is how it's always going to be. And I can't just live in that constant panic and survive. So I have to just accept it and be like, well, this is my life. I guess I'm going into credit card debt at 20% interest so that I can pay for a tooth. Cool. So I think that I, 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 I mean, I, I kept that rant six minutes. I feel, I think that's pretty good for me, you know? So forgive me. But also, I'm not sorry. <sighs> I'm sorry, guys. I'm in a mood. I feel like I have just spent the last few months walking around in this constant state of like simmering rage. And as I get closer and closer to the date of my vacation, I find myself like my patience is thinner and thinner. And I'm going to snap. And it's probably going to be something that's just like irrelevant and doesn't make any sense to snap over, but I like kind of feel it coming. So forgive me if it, uh, if you happen to see the snap in real time, know that that's where it's coming from. All right. So we'll talk about the situation on this Island. And again, y'all are going to have to help me with names. So if you guys can give me the name of the Island, well, it's not named. That's right. He says there's no name. Um, give me the name of the King and the name of the, uh, military dude that winds up helping them out and the name of the witch. The name of the witch is a really good like book name or band name or something. I'm going to put that in my little file. So I really, really, really enjoyed these three episodes a lot. Um, it's kind of funny because I like, I think it's that this situation feels different in so many ways than the others we've run into. Um, and by others we've run into, I mean, when we've landed on inhabited islands, other than the island with the uh, exclusively the bounty hunter club, basically. Um we have often landed somewhere where there is like a, an extremely terror, terrorizing person in power and people are desperate for help. And it turns out that is the situation here in the end. But when we first land, folks are not super welcoming and like, Hey, help us. Or, you know, Hey, you better watch your back because so-and-so who rules here isn't going to like that you're here. They are so adversarial as a reflex to Luffy and his crew, because it turns out they got completely pwned. And I hate that I used that. I am sorry for that one by Blackbeard. I think it was. And a, but like he had like five pirates total, and they specifically say that, like, yeah, we know there weren't that many of you, but this other guy who came in and wrecked our shit also didn't have that many people. So, low-key, that doesn't really seem to matter. Like, we kind of are going to be incredibly wary of everyone. Um, <laughs> sorry, guys, I got this thing started and Bernadette's talking about how I can't imagine how you guys do it without universal health care. You know, how we do it is we die. That's how we do it. It's great. Super good. America's great. Um, Wapole is the king. Thank you, Gabriella. Wapole is a bad name. Now, it may be a traditional name, like in Japanese or something, or maybe it's another sort of like uh, another language that he's borrowing something from because we're supposed to be in what feels like kind of a Scandinavian-esque setting here. But, uh, I, I really don't like, it doesn't roll off the tongue. It feels wrong. 
and it doesn't suit him. Everybody else, I feel like their their names have sort of gone with the person, and it. I just don't see it for him. I don't know. I think I think I'm going to have the most trouble with him because a lot of people. Their, if their names suit enough, I can sort of make a mental like connection. But that one's going to be tough. Um, it has been the drum before. Drum Island, that's right. Or Drum Village? Uh, drum Island. Thank you, Gus. Yes. And it's currently unnamed because the king abandoned them. But um, surprise, he's back and he sucks as much as ever. And Korea is the witch. Thank you, Gabriella. So... When they when they pull up on these people, as we ended the last episode, um, Vivi got shot. And I don't think anybody was like worried that Vivi was dead, right? We know that she's going to be okay. We can't just be heading for Alabasta with the princess and then the princess just drops dead. That would be that would be shocking. I'll give them that. We could we could do that if you want to really pull something out of left field, but um, I, I didn't expect though, that she was going to be almost completely fine. I thought she was going to be down for the count with like a serious wound and it would make them even more desperate to find a doctor because they now had two people who were in dire straits. And instead she's just been barely grazed and Luffy starts to completely lose his shit, which like, I, I don't blame him. You know, you've got a bunch of people who just shot your friend. Like, if that doesn't make you enraged, it, it, maybe you don't like your friends that much. However, he, when, when Luffy loses his shit, it's a very different situation than you or I losing our shit. And Vivi has to step in front of him as he's about to like leap off of the ship and go after these people. And she is just like, um, you want to be captain? You want to like be worthy of the name captain? Then you can't do reckless garbage, like start a fight with an entire village full of people while we are just sitting ducks on a ship in pure, like we are in, in firing range as we have just seen of all of them how about you stop and think for a fucking second dude and luffy has a moment of just being like wait what and there's something about the camera sort of zooms in on the blood dripping onto the deck and on vivi because she gets down and like bows on the ground in in a gesture of like complete desperation and submissiveness and is begging them to please help her friend. We won't even get off the ship. And Luffy, it's like, I think a combo of him looking at her approach overall and the way she's appealing to their sense of decency and the fact that she was wounded and she's just going to deal with it. And there's a part of him, I think, that really respects the fact that she's like, yeah, I got shot. Oh, well, you know, there's like just something about that that you can tell he's like, wow, OK. And he takes her advice and he follows her example and gets down on the deck next to her and begs with her. I loved this so much, y'all. Any time, any time in, in fiction that a dude, I mean, I say in fiction, I would like to say in nonfiction also, but it's just so rare. Uh, any time a guy listens to a woman, stops and like rethinks things and then follows that woman's example on how to behave in a given situation rather than getting angry at her telling him what to do or resentful over the fact that maybe she has more experience in this area or whatever. It is like my favorite thing. I just, this is for me. If you want to get across to me that a guy is a good person, that that is the way to do it. This is something that also, um, 
I was covering the Ray Bearer series, or I just covered the first book, not the whole series. First of all, y'all know how much I love Cradle, and I talk about Cradle all the time, and that everybody should read it because I love it, and it's so fun. I will say that Ray Bearer falls in, like, top three, along with Cradle, of things that I've covered for the show. It was so good. And a major part of that story is men who are like they have enough growth and security in their own abilities and their own masculinity to a point as well to not be threatened by the skills and talent of women around them and it is just an ongoing thing i mean the number of women out there who have had their work stolen and they weren't given credit. It's really like it's a pervasive problem or women who it's not even that their work was stolen necessarily. It's that they presented something and it wasn't taken seriously. And then a man presented almost something identical and it was immediately adopted. This actually a really close friend of mine, guys, this one was the kind of thing that I it's been like four years and I haven't stopped thinking about it since it happened. She worked at this public library and it was right after the election and the woman's march was being organized. And she went to the people who run the library and said, you know, we have this huge display case in the entryway of the library. We should do a display about the history of women's rights and protests in the United States. And they said, no, they turned her down. And no joke, three weeks later, her male colleague suggested the exact same thing. And he did it via email and copied everybody in on it. And she got copied in on the email in which they said that was a great idea. No joke. It was for women's rights. And she was told no, and a guy was told yes. Like, you couldn't find a more perfect example of that kind of thing in life if you tried. Like, that, if it was fiction, you would be like, this is a little heavy-handed. And it was actually what happened to her. And I never forget. She was, like, asking me, like, what should I do? And I wrote this sort of scathing email that was extremely professional, but just, you know. And she didn't wind up using it, and she was like, uh, about a week later, she was like, I was way more mild and I kind of wish I had just used what you said because it wasn't rude, but it really let them have it. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I understand not wanting to do that, though, because, again, as a woman, you're not really allowed to have feelings in the workplace or bring things up that you are angry about. So anyway, another tangent. This is just tangent central today. I'm sorry. Um, but this moment, like I said. You guys have heard me talk about how Luffy isn't the captain. You know, I already said, obviously, Nami is the one that everybody depends on. They literally can't sail without her expertise. And they don't really seem to, like, get serious unless she starts to get mad and tells them to fucking shape up. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't really feel like he's in charge other than being the one who got them all together in the first place. And there's this this moment here where she, like, Vivi actually says, like, you're a disgrace or something like that. And I was like, whoa, I wouldn't have used that wording. But I wasn't mad at her for using it either. You know, it was the kind of thing where I was like, maybe this is what he needed to hear because Luffy is reckless. That's part of his personality. And to a degree, it can be part of his charm. But it's one thing when you're just putting yourself at risk. And it's another thing when you're putting your entire ship full of people at risk. Um, so, yeah, this this whole thing, just the start of it was so unexpected. You guys, like, heard my my frustration at the end of the last episode at thinking, are both female characters going to be sidelined and in trouble? And no, we start this one off in just such a powerful moment for Vivi that I wasn't ready for. And it made me so happy. It was just very unexpected. So eventually the dude in charge, guys, help me. What's his name? Um, Dalton. Thank you, Gus. 
Dalton tells them, all right, you know what? Come into the village. And uh, later on, the people are like, are you sure about this? And he's like, I just don't think they're a threat. And I was like, harsh, but fair. Um, they are a threat. Like, we know how badass our friends are. But in this moment, of course not. And he brings them in and he's very sort of cagey about the situation on the island. They ask him what the name of it is. Like, he, he says, oh, we don't have a name yet. And they're like, that doesn't sound real. What? Um, he brings them to a, I think it's to his house, right? And he's, <laughs> guys, he puts Nami into a bed and later on, Luffy is talking about <laughs> about how people who live in these cold climates can't sleep because they'll die. And Sanji asks, then why does he have a bed? And Luffy's like, maybe for when he dies. <laughs> I don't know why that made me laugh so hard. I my my own like the things that trigger me to really crack up can be so surprising. You know, there are things that are a genuine good joke that I think is really witty and well done. And I won't really laugh out loud. I'll just sort of smile and be like, that was pretty good. But then there are things that will catch me and I will just like crack up. And it's so often something that Luffy says, or it will be something like a, a reaction that people have because the show is big on overblown over the top reactions in the last three episodes, there's a moment where um, I think it's Luffy and Karu and they're in the background while Sanji's in the foreground talking to Vivi and they're f freaking out about how Nami might be about to die. And it's just like them like kind of, passing back and forth across the screen in the background absolutely panicking and i was sitting next to owen watching this episode and their panic goes on for like a while and is insanely over the top and i just was watching it and owen like looked at me to see my reaction and i just looked at him and said i love this show babe <laughs> They just, they're, it's so absurd so much of the time. And it's like, I'm going to go in on the absurd 100% and we're going to do it balls to the walls always. And I love that energy. Ah, so good. So anyway, um, meanwhile, outside as Nami is like, you know, seriously ill on, in a bed, we have, um, Luffy and Usopp making snow sculptures outside. And uh, that really does feel so in character. Do we know, I'm just realizing, do we know what it is that these drum-like like formations on the island actually are? Because they look like buildings almost from far away. But then we see like there's all kinds of you know, the village is not comprised of those because I sort of wondered if it was going to turn out that the people live in them. Um, I don't um, the camera is zooming in on one right now. And so the witch is the one that lives at the top of one, but she's the only one. Right. Um, sorry, guys, my my subtitles turned off here. <laughs> okay, it's in Japanese, but subtitles are off. No, I need those. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Netflix. Um, so, yeah, we find out that there are no doctors here. And the only person that they rely... <laughs> Guys, I'm sorry, but this is so perfect. The only person that they have to rely on is this witchy woman they call her a witch she's just very old and she dresses like buffy the vampire slayer or something like she is dressing like she's like 17 in 1992 and honestly i am a hundred percent 
here for it. I want to be like this, you know, like I really do. I want as an old woman for people to double take and be like, what is she doing? I mean, I just, life is too short, man. That is what I want. Yes. Look twice and be puzzled. I'm fine. Go ahead. The thing with her, though, that I find so frustrating, again, to go back to the actual situation here in the United States, is that she is not a doctor. She clearly knows what she's doing. She doesn't need to be a doctor to be trained and know a lot of information. But this does really like hit home for me as somebody who doesn't have health insurance. And most of my friends don't either unless they have a good job. We as Americans are often forced to turn to alternative medicine as a means of attempting to alleviate symptoms or find answers to what ails us because we can't afford to see a real doctor. And so the fact that she's all that's left to them and they simultaneously like resent and desperately need her. And it just, especially like what's it's really been thrown into such relief with the pandemic. People don't trust the pharmaceutical companies and whatnot. And like, I, I definitely understand that. And to a point, there's a reason, you know, but it, it like kind of turns a corner where it becomes, it becomes less logical. The things that people are paranoid about happening. And it's really funny because there's like this sort of assertion that like, well, you know, they are they they have the solution to curing cancer, but they won't release it because then where would they make their money? And I guess I mean, like, I don't think that's true at all. But if you want to think that way, fine. It's just weird because then we give away vaccinations and they're suspicious of that also. And nobody's making like tons of bank off that because they're being donated and funded federally so like what why how so anyway this lady have you guys ever seen the extremely bad series on i think it was on the hallmark channel and then became a netflix series the good witch the good witch is and it's like something that's very close to my heart because even though it's really bad it's bad in this very comforting sort of goofy background way that I enjoy putting on around the holidays, especially. And the good, Witch is this like just impossibly youthful looking, probably like 45 year old woman who is vaguely mysterious in a way that implies she perhaps has like powers and depends on herbs and essential oils and gives advice to people in the town based on those things. And they always work out, you know, her suggestions, if it's not the oil itself that does it, it'll be some event that's put into motion by someone using that oil. And it'll sort of the implication is like, oh, the oil is just the prop she used to get everything else rolling along because she knew exactly how everybody was going to react. And the good witch for me is how I think a lot of um, anti-vax moms, like the goop type moms, that's how they see themselves. And this witch lady is in many ways, I think, also how they see themselves. And it's like, no, you're just you're just peddling like snake oil. You know, you're out here just stating flat out misinformation or shit that's completely unsubstantiated. This lady has medical knowledge that's actually based in biology and fact. And she may not be a doctor, but obviously fucking knows what the hell she's doing. And that's the difference. You know, somebody with like, uh, at least what, six decades at this point of experience and training, probably more 
that really counts for something. So I think a lot of these, uh, and I always say women because those are the people that I am exposed to the most, but I'm sure men out there too, they want to pretend that they're like, they're the village wise woman. And it's just so intensely not the, the role they play. And a, they just want to be something they're not. And it's just, there's something very pitiful about it. Um, Bernadette, this is such a dumb fucking theory. Sorry, I did my PhD in molecular oncology and now work for a pharmaceutical company. Ain't nobody has a cure for cancer. This shit is so complicated and treacherous. And as the population gets older, there will be more cancer. If anyone had a cure, this shit would be on the market, making them a shitload of money. And then rants are contagious. Bernadette, you know what? I really appreciate your perspective on that specifically from because of your experience. And I also appreciate that my rant inspired your rant because that makes me feel like everybody, like we're all on the same page getting frustrated with the same shit. And that just, that's sort of encouraging to me. You know, it's a very comforting thing. So I appreciate you. And yeah, that's the other thing is like, do you not think people would pay thousands and thousands of dollars? Like, you know, and and if you think that you can't trust the pharmaceutical companies because they're able to make more money if you have cancer than if you don't, maybe it's for profit healthcare that's the problem. How about we fucking look at that? That's the next logical step. But no, somehow that never winds up being where we go with it. It's just wild. Anyway, so. This bitch lives at the top of a mountain. She's about as far off as one can get. And it sounds like there's a good reason nobody, like a person like her would not want to be living down in the fucking village. This king sounds like a, a complete disaster. And if you're stuck on this damn rock with all of these people, then getting as far away from him as you can and making it extremely inconvenient for anyone to get to you that has its appeal. Um, so that is where they are going to have to go and bring Nami to get her help. But the thing is, uh, she is coming down to the village or is already here. What we find out later is that what's his face? Um, sorry guys, the, I'm scrolling Dalton. Dalton knew that the witch had come to town, but he didn't know she was still here. So he tells them, like, in good faith, that's where she lives. You're going to have to find her. Also, beware of the bunnies. These killer bunnies are truly wonderful. I am. It's just great. There's the bunnies and then there's the hiking bears who are humongous and have the little hiking stick and are just very polite and walk by you and give you like a, a little bow of acknowledgement as they're hiking. This is good shit. This is what I live for. Um, so yeah, he tells them in good faith because he thinks that she's gone back, but it turns out she's still there. So Sanji and Luffy head up there carrying Nami. And then it turns out, they have to turn around and come back and it like, it's a comedy of errors and all of this stuff. Um, but I, th this is the kind of plot point that I think is extremely effective, but personally gives me such anxiety. The, um, you're going somewhere to find somebody and they're coming to, like towards you and you're going to cross over and miss each other by like minutes and thus won't be able to solve either of your problems because this is like a classic thing in so much literature and sometimes it can be utilized extremely well and sometimes it can feel lazy and purposefully frustrating in a way that I think is like extremely irritating rather than effective. Um, and here, I think it's effective and it makes sense for the show and the way the show is constructed for it to go this way. But, oh, seeing them like trug trudging through the snow and how 
completely like flattened they almost are by the wind and then a um avalanche and everything i was just like this is so unfair so this meanwhile um Usopp and Vivi stay behind and Vivi has a few moments where she is hearing about the king and the way that he behaved and she keeps being absolutely outraged and just saying things like what kind of king would do that that's not even ruling and Dalton keeps looking at her and being like I know you from somewhere who are you like well, something's up here. And eventually later on, it, it seems like he's put it together exactly who she is. But it's clear. She like even mentioned something about my father brought me to a monarch meeting. And I was like, Vivi, sweetie, if you're trying to keep a low profile, maybe don't talk about how your dad took you to a meeting full of monarchs. I am just saying probably not the best way to fly under the radar. That's all I'm saying. So by the end of this episode, we have um, Luffy and Sanji being attacked by these rabbits, which are vicious. There's a huge wall of much bigger ones later on. And the episode ends on the uh, ship owned by, and I don't know if there's a name for this ship but it's like the submarine one and we have that dude who looks like he's about to burst into tears all the time that sort of harlequin-esque looking guy uh with his binoculars telling the king oh hey we're almost at the island so when we start the next episode we have the uh the rabbit attack uh, one of them is down and the rest completely like go airborne at them. This moment, I just, there is something about choosing rabbits for this because at one point Luffy thinks they must be polar bears and like polar bears would be what most people would probably choose for a snowy setting if you're going to have a vicious and intimidating wild animal. And the fact that it's bunnies instead is inspired. Truly wonderful. It has been mentioned more than once that if they fall into the snow, Nami is in such bad shape that she might not be able to survive it. So at this point, Luffy is like, he he attacks and Sanji has tried to tell him not to put Nami at risk more than once. And they seem to have gotten away at one point. And Luffy turns around and sticks his tongue out at them. And Sanji is like, oh my God, why? Why would you do that right now? Because it seems to provoke them to come after them. So... We have the information from Dalton um, about the king and the what he did basically being like, oh, all these doctors are my doctors now and people get to use these doctors if I decide they get to use these doctors. And that just seems like the thing that a king should get to do. So mm, tough. And also the moment in the pub i guess restaurant where we see the witch for the first time she has very similar energy in a lot of ways to the dude with the heart sunglasses from Usopp's island um she's just really really thin and angular and the way that she's dressed feels like vaguely 70s, but in 70s in the way that actually feels like the 90s. Do you guys remember how that was a thing in the 90s? And that's what, like now we're going to the 80s um, and early 90s as well uh, in 2020. So she comes in. She's in these purple hip hugger bell bottoms with like a pink lightning bolt up one leg 
a white crop top with like hearts all over it and a purple what looks like pleather jacket with tons of zippers and these like sunglasses I am assuming they're sunglasses specifically because she puts them up when she comes inside and she has this pet with her oh my god she has two pairs of glasses I didn't notice that last time um, but yeah, she walks in and this pet is like an odd combo of almost looking like a reindeer at times and then looking like a bear at other times. It has hooves, so I'm pretty confident it's more like supposed to be more like a reindeer, but it's wearing a hat also. And I guess it's probably got a similar thing going on as Karoo, where it's like, a being that has some sort of consciousness of its own, even though it doesn't talk. So she comes in, everybody has these really extreme reactions to seeing her. And there's this little kid here who is crying and his dad has been asking him what's wrong. And it's almost like the crying attracted her. Like she could feel the fact that this kid was in trouble and like came here because of the crying. And the, she asks the dad, do you want me to fix this kid for you? And the dad is like, there's nothing to fix. He's fine. Nothing. And she's like, oh, really? Oh, okay. Are you a doctor? And then she just turns around to leave. And the guy has to be like, no, 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 wait, 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 come back, come back. And she winds up figuring out that there is something going on with his hands. This killed me. She's like, oh, your hands hurt? And she like pokes him somewhere else. And she's just like, yeah, uh, I just wanted to distract you so that you could, you know, that pain wouldn't bother you so much. And when she looks at him, he has this like infection that could have killed him. And... In exchange for fixing this kid, she tells them that she wants, and this was wonderful to me, she wants, uh, I'm almost out of trash bags and toilet paper, which there's something about how practical that is that was very surprising. Um, and also all the plum wine and food you have, and I'll take 50% of this restaurant's assets. And when she says 50% of this restaurant's assets, I really wanted to be like, what is, what does that exactly mean? Like, is she saying empty your register? Or is she saying like, I want you to sell off all your stock and sell your stock to me or give me the proceeds. Like there is something about using the word assets that felt so vague that I was like, I really, I'm not even sure what that entails. But of course... They are all outraged. People are saying, oh, it's a ripoff. Um, he can't have been on the edge of death. You're abusing your position and taking advantage of somebody who is sick and has no other options. And they are really like going at her. And look, this is the problem. When you only have one option for healthcare is that they can kind of do whatever the fuck they want and you don't really get to say or do anything about it unless you are just willing to drop dead. So, you know, I'm not saying what she's doing is fair, but uh, it is what it is. So this kid sort of wakes up and says, I'm feeling a lot better and he smiles at her and says, thank you. And she grins and says, oh, okay, your son gave me a tip. So I will uh, reduce my fee to 49%. I love that she has a belly ring. I don't know how I missed that. But God, again, with the 90s, this is just everything. So she tells the kid the happiness that you feel right now. Don't ever forget it which is sort of an odd thing. I feel like what she's, the point is supposed to be like, 
you should always be grateful to me. I don't know if it's like, is that what she means? Um, I, I'm, I'm like, or is it just rem- always remember how precious your life is? Perhaps that's what she meant. Uh, oh, people are saying it's a reindeer. Bernadette says, no, no, not a reindeer, a raccoon. Don't you mess with me, Bernadette. Don't promise me raccoons. How dare you? Ryan says, healthcare costing half your assets. How unbelievable, right? (sighs) Oh my God. And guys, I haven't mentioned this, but throughout all of this, we cut back and forth to Zorro, who is engaging in increasingly absurd and risky exercises I enjoy this so much. Like Zoro is 100% somebody who would be really into CrossFit. And he is out here like going swimming in the freezing cold. He's doing like handstand push-ups with one arm in the snow. Everything is so over the top with him. And eventually, because the storm really starts to get bad, he is like stuck out there and he runs across the witch and is very rude to her. And unsurprisingly, she does not want to take him on her sleigh. I loved her whole reaction here. Um, she, she He's like says something about like what an old hag, hag she is. And she says, be careful what you say. Fucking dex him. And then it says, let's go, Chopper. We don't have time to bother with a weirdo. Which call her calling Zoro a weirdo is just wonderful. I really love whenever a real weird person calls another person weird. Because it just feels like it's so much more insulting and meaningful if they are willing to say that. Um, and Zoro is just stuck out there in the freezing cold. Throughout all of this, Dalton has been like trying in a sled to catch up to our friends because they are trying to tell him, hey, the witch is in town, actually. And as all this is going on, Wapple has landed on the island and they see the ship, Luffy's ship. And so he realizes that these guys are on his island and he is super upset. His two henchmen, we've got the guy who looks like he's always going to cry, who is sort of like a uh, Harlequin. And then we've got this dude with like a massive afro and beard and mustache. It's a weird thing because like the texture of hair you would have to have to have the mustache does not feel like it's it would go with having an afro. But regardless, that is what he has. And... um he has a much more sort of sinister vibe. Like the, the crying dude is certainly not a good person. It's tempting because of how sad he always looks for me to go like, Oh, he doesn't want to be doing this, but I don't think that's true. I think he just, that's his face and he does 100% want to be doing this. But the other guy has a constant, like I'm scheming evil face. And so in comparison, it just makes the other dude look so harmless. Um, so, at this point, one of the um, guards who's like, you know, stationed at the edges of the island, he comes running into the restaurant where Dalton is and informs him, hey, um, everybody is dead except for me and the king is back. And the next episode... I, like there was a part of me that wanted to be like, oh, I only have 10 minutes left to talk about the next episode. But so much of the next episode is taken up by this avalanche that I don't feel like I, I've talked about a lot of what happened already. And the avalanche just it doesn't feel like there's all that much to say about it. It's the the implication is that the bunnies started it on purpose. And. Later on, they wind up like coming across one of them, a baby 
whose parent is buried in the snow. And Luffy still saves the the parent. I'm, I think it's a parent. And in a moment when this animal clearly, like, expected the two of them to, uh, you know, just fight it for no reason. And I have to assume that this means they are going to wind up needing help later. And these bunnies are going to have their back after all because they needed it. And they were there to help, even though they didn't need to at the time. Um, Everybody in town, of course, is panicking because of this, like, this avalanche is heading for them. So I thought that it was just going to be something that affected Luffy and uh, Sanji. But it's coming down and ready to take the whole town out. And Wapole is on the back of this animal who I don't feel like I've got a good grip on what kind of animal he's supposed to be. But everybody is trying to climb up there with him. And of course he will not let anybody join him. And even so he books it and doesn't make it. The avalanche winds up catching up to them anyway. I'm sure he's fine. I'm sure we have not seen the last of him, but it was definitely like, I thought that they were going to, you know, escape by the skin of their teeth and they get hit pretty good. Wapple, um, he winds up saying that he thinks Luffy is the one who started the avalanche. Like him and Sanji were up there aware that Wapple was on the island and the two of them started this, this avalanche as a weapon, which I mean, that is what the the rabbits did. So I guess there's no, uh, (laughs) that is a technique that some people might use. Um, I love this little rabbit too, who is like posturing so much, like I'll kick the shit out of you. But when it comes down to it and Luffy reaches toward him, all this little guy can do is like cover his head and be afraid. This like stray animals. I just feel for them so much. And they're not strays. They're actually wild animals. But I have a family of like six cats that lives outside my house. And uh, the female was several months ago, so rail thin. And I joked around, we started feeding her. I joked around to Owen, this bitch is going to get knocked up and she's going to have her kittens right here. And we're going to have to deal with these kittens. And turns out she was pregnant already. So we didn't see her for like a week. And then all of a sudden she started turning up, like eating again. And her little kittens were like hiding and waiting for her to go back. And eventually they started to come out and eat too. And now she lets me pet her, even though she didn't want me to come near her before. I'm just desperately wanting to pet the kittens, but they don't want anything to do with me. But anyway, this moment with these little guys, just, I I really enjoy them. They're fun. Um, And I should mention, too, that Walpole has this, like, conversation with Dalton in front of the whole town about how, uh, you know, he's definitely not going to let people have the doctors back. That's not (laughs) – we're absolutely not doing that. And Dalton sort of offers to go into exile. If you guys can remember exactly how the – like, what his plan was, everybody starts yelling, like, Dalton, you were the only one who had our backs at all. You can't leave. And I feel like I missed exactly what he was trying to suggest because it was meant, whatever his plan was, it was meant to be a way to get Wapole off the island. He was just trying to make sure that the people here didn't have to deal with this guy anymore. Um, Is it just me or is the animal that Wapole's riding like, looks like a hippopotamus a little bit. I, I, I hope it's not because I love the whole like weirdness of hippopotami, hippopotamuses. And uh, I don't want one of them to be his sidekick animal, but maybe I don't get a choice in that. Um, And this is when we see Dalton turn into his bison form. I have to say... Weak sauce. That is a bad power. It 
doesn't feel like there are really any advantages to it, except that he's like sort of bulletproof. But like it turns out he's not. He winds up getting shot with arrows. Those work on him. I guess it's supposed to be that like bullets don't, but arrows do. Um, and it turns out that uh, our Harlequin guy here knows that that is his weakness. And so is able to like, he fires like three arrows at once and takes him down. Um, Dalton like throws himself in front of the villagers because it looks like he, this dude is aiming for them. He probably is aware Dalton will throw himself in front of it. You know, I, this, this moment, I wasn't entirely clear on why this is the weakness of his, because it, it, is it supposed to be because bison were hunted with bow and arrow in, in like history? I didn't really understand why that was his weakness in particular. And like, sometimes the weaknesses of, of people who have superpowers don't make a lot of sense, you know? So it doesn't necessarily need to be anything in particular that would, you know, I don't know what would make sense as a bison's weakness. I don't know anything about bison. Um, but yeah, he winds up throwing himself in front of these villagers. He gets shot and I don't think we see him again at all in the episode. So I don't know. I don't know if he's dead. It seems like he's dead. Walpole says something like, oh, that's a death befitting you. But just because he says that does not mean the dude is dead. I have to assume that he'll be back. But it did look like he got pretty well got. And he goes down and then there's an avalanche. So, I mean, it feels like he would have to be buried. I don't know. Um, I love to, the like, in the avalanche, Walpole, like, accidentally starts to eat his own guys because he's eating his way out. You doof. Um, and they wind up uh, catching up to Luffy. Wapole is looking down at him. Luffy is carrying, at that point, both Sanji and Nami. His face is so red. They do a really good job of making him look like he is freezing. At one point, Luffy or uh, Sanji asks him, why are you wearing no shoes? And he says just basically it's my policy, but he says at first it's like my police. Um, and I forget exactly how Sanji injured himself. He, I think it might've been in trying to help them get away from the avalanche and like, you know, also get away from the bunnies. Uh, but evidently, yeah, he is in no condition to be able to uh, carry his own weight now. So Luffy is just kind of having to hope for the best and drag them both. And I mean, he's very strong, so he's doing it. But considering everything, I mean, where is he? And and we don't know. He's heading back down the side of the mountain. But we saw the witch going up the side of the mountain, passing Zoro on her way up. So... I don't know when we're going to get across another doctor or if we will see her again. I, I don't know. Like, you know, I'm worried about Nami is what I'm saying. I know nothing's going to happen to her. Like, of course it's not, but I don't like seeing her this way. Um, let's see. The weakness isn't arrows specifically. It's that Dalton won't let the villagers get hurt. So arrow dude attack the villagers. Oh, Gus says the Harlequin guy knows his weakness is the villagers. Oh, I totally didn't get that. Thank you, guys. Dodoy. That makes so much sense. I can't believe I didn't get that. Um, He's heading up to the castle. He doesn't know they're not there. Oh, is he? Gabriella, there are a couple moments where it looks like he's going downhill. So I thought he was turning back around again. It just must be, you know, the way it's animated. But I thought after the... um the avalanche he was just like welp and i should have known better of course he isn't going to just turn around but i yeah it was just the way that it was illustrated that made made it look like he was like heading back down the side of the mountain again 
So, and his fight with Wapple, like, he's got two friends here that he needs to protect who are sort of out of commission. I hope Zoro stumbles across them since he happens to be out in these woods. Um, because Luffy could definitely use some backup here. Otherwise, if they're willing to, like, use the villagers against Dalton, I don't see why they wouldn't use Nami against Luffy, you know? Yeah, so that is where the episode ends, is, like, Luffy and Wapol staring each other down, and then just, uh, to be continued... So I'm going to wrap this up. But thank you again, Bernadette, for commissioning this episode. Thank you guys for uh, feeding me names and information in the chat, even though I, an allegedly intelligent person, did not put two and two together. And I'm just really enjoying this show. And also, there is something delightful about being on a winter island right now because it's like we're getting into the holiday season. So it just feels like very seasonal to me. And uh, I had just been talking to you guys about being like the way that the area works in the grand line with all these islands having different climates about how I was in animal crossing and I went to like a winter Island. So then when I put this on and it was a, a winter Island, I was like, Oh, look at that. Another one. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I'm into it definitely. And this witch is just so much fun. I want to know more about her. Like, where the fuck did she come from? 139 years old. Damn. Um, all right. I will see you guys soon with a new episode. Um, next week, I'll be having like my regular recordings. And then the week after that is when I start my vacation. So there will be nothing for three weeks. Longest time off I have ever taken since I started doing this. So, uh, that'll be really, that'll be something. I'm wondering if I'm going to be like desperate to come back and record by the time it's over, or am I going to be like, you know, that was pretty nice. I could, uh, I could keep, I could keep doing that. Part of me kind of expects to just be like, oh, I want to get back to work really bad, but we'll see. So, all right, guys. Um, I will see you next Tuesday. I think, let me just double check that that's true. Yes. And until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.